Hey, hello, everybody. Um, I am going to go over chapter 15 uh, in this video. And in the next video, I will go over chapter 16, which will be the last chapter uh, for the semester. Um, okay. So I'm going to be talking about physical development and a little bit about that. Um, first of all, uh, middle adulthood uh, is the lifespan between around 40 years old to around 65 years old. Um, and uh, then 60 to around 65 usually is thought of as a transition into late adulthood. Uh, those are kind of retirement age. Um, okay. Now, uh, during uh, middle adulthood, uh, cognitive development is at its peak and uh, physical development is starting to go down uh, significantly. Um, you don't feel it all at once, but little by little and sort of over the decades, uh, it goes down in a pretty uh, uh, normal way for most people. Now, I say normal, but um, everybody is a little bit different, right? This is uh, inter-individual variability. Um, no two people sort of age at the same rate. And you'll notice that there are some people who are in their 50s or 60s, and they still look good and they are still active. And sometimes there's people who are in their, you know, uh, late 40s, and they, you know, life has hit them hard. Um, so, Obviously, uh, there's going to be a lot of changes to the body, um, and especially to what we call the uh, integumentary system, um, which basically uh, includes the senses, reaction time, lung capacity, uh, nails, skin, body. Um, and we start seeing a downturn here. So for example, hair starts to gray. If you are a man, uh, you might start to lose a lot of hair. Uh, there are people who lose their hair early, right? I lost my hair very, very young. But as you get older, uh, that becomes more common and more people obviously start to show these traits. Um, the same thing is true with your skin. Now, the proteins that allow your skin to be sort of elastic, that allow it to sort of get back into place, um, you're not producing as much of those. And so your skin doesn't become quite as elastic. And this is why, in part, your skin starts to sag a little. Um, sensory function also changes. Um, so your vision gets a little bit worse. Um, your hearing gets worse, etc. cetera. Um, uh, presbyopia is uh, the loss of the elasticity to the lens. Uh, remember that your eye, the part that you see is your iris, the colored portion, and then the pupil, which is the hole that light goes into. But behind the pupil, inside, you have your lens. And your lens should be flexible because there are muscles that pull on it to make it flatter and sort of relax to make it uh, more uh, more lens shaped, more uh, oval shaped, um, and that allows the light to uh, be focused better. As your lens gets harder, that becomes more difficult to do, and if it gets hard enough. Um, you might develop uh, cataracts. Let me go back here. You might uh, develop uh, catara uh, cataracts, which basically means that the lens has completely hardened and now no light is getting through. And basically you're blind, not because there's something wrong with your retina, but because the light really can't get through uh, the cataracts uh, of the lens. Uh, there are... Uh, surgeries where they could remove the, the the lens, your natural lens, which is hardened now, and they can insert a uh, an artificial lens into the eye to allow uh, you to see better. 
reaction time also goes down. Reaction time actually starts going down almost immediately after you hit 25 years old. Remember, all throughout the semester, I've been telling you, your brain isn't really developed until you're around 25 years old. There, you know, it's mostly developed by the time that you are in your late teens and early 20s, but there's still some connections that are not there. There are still some uh, myelin that is not developed, et cetera, et cetera. But almost immediately after you hit 25 and your brain is quote unquote what developed, um, uh, your reactions time starts to go down. It's one of the first things to start slowing down. Um, lung capacity, also when you get into middle age, uh, starts to go down. This has to usually do with uh, the tissue stiffening. And so you can't uh, expand them quite as much. And the same thing is true with lean body mass, that is your muscle. Muscle continuously uh, gets lower as you get older. And through your uh, middle uh, adulthood, about every 10 years, you're losing quite a significant amount of muscle. Now, when you're in your 40s and 50s, um, if you're working out enough on a regular basis, you don't really notice a lot of that because you're building up enough muscle, you're still working out. But as you get into your 60s and 70s uh, or you know, into uh, late adulthood, now, even if you're working out on a regular basis, you're still not making up the amount of muscle that you're losing. And of course, when you lose body fat, usually uh, fat replaces the body mass. That is, fat replaces the muscle. By the way, people will sometimes say that your muscle turns to fat. That's fat and muscle are two completely different things in your body. Um, uh, and so it's not that your muscle is turning into fat, it's that you're losing muscle and your body is creating fat. Um, and so it's two different systems, but it does, uh, they do sort of flow together. Um, as I mentioned, you're gonna lose a lot of muscle. It is gradual, H exercise helps. Um, and of course, uh, the more you exercise, the better your vigor, your strength, your health, um, and of course, your body shape, which, you know, there was a time in the past where by the time you were in your 50s, you were considered an old person, but that's no longer the case. And you're in your 50s, you still want to enjoy your life and there's things to do. And obviously, you want to be in shape in order to do those. Um, metabolism also uh, starts to go down. Obviously, your metabolism is how well you burn through uh, the energy that your food produces. Um, you, again, uh, your metabolic uh, uh, rate goes down, uh, which means that when you're sitting still, right, and you're young, your body is still burning a certain amount of energy. Um, when As you get older, that goes down significantly. And so, uh, one of the things that happen as you enter middle age is that you're going to gain weight, especially if you're not going to the gym on a regular basis, jogging on a regular basis, etc. So it is important to keep track of uh, your activity. And, uh, you know, now in middle age, even if you're not eating a whole lot, your body is still making more fat because you are not burning as much as you used to burn. Also, as you get older, bone density goes down, um, uh, especially if you are not taking the right kinds of uh, vitamins, um, calcium, etc. cetera. Uh, your bones might become more brittle, more prone to fracture. And of course, the older you get, the more likely it is that if you fall, then you might actually break a bone. Aerobic, oh, excuse me, aerobic capacity, um, also becomes less efficient. And so uh, as you get older, uh, you take in less oxygen into the lungs. And so there's less oxygen getting to the heart and other parts of your body. Uh, uh, 
tissues in the body also become uh, less capable of taking up glucose from your uh, bloodstream. And so that glucose will in turn turn to fat if you don't get rid of it. Um, because now uh, your muscles are just not as good as taking in the glucose. Some other health issues. Um, uh, the health of people between 40 to 65 uh, in uh, developed uh, nations tends to be pretty good. Uh, people living in America, in most of Western Europe, in Australia, let's say Britain, um, these individuals can live between 40 and 65 and, and have pretty good, decent lives, and they are still going out and they're still enjoying their life. Um, there are uh, racial and ethnic uh, differences, gender differences also exist. Um, usually, uh, if you are doing well financially, uh, then you take it to live a better life. And if you don't do as well financially, then you know you might have a, a more difficult time in your older years. And sure enough, you know, if you're doing, you, if you're part of the majority group, then you tend to do better than you if you're part of a minority, a minority group. So, um, a tip to improve health, undergo regular uh, medical checkups. And again, that goes back to that idea of, you know, if you have insurance, if you make good money, if you have a good job, you're more likely to get those medical checkups. Maintain a strict uh, diet. And again, if you make good money, if you have uh, time to come home and prepare a good meal, then you get to live a better life. Um, if you come home tired or you work two jobs, um, uh, there's a, hard, a chance that you are not going to have as good of a diet. Exercise regularly. Men tend to exercise more regularly than women, although that has, is changing. Um, women are certainly exercising more often, and usually white women exercise a lot more often than Latina and uh, African-American women. And so again, that goes back to that gender and ethnic differences. Avoid smoking. Uh, in America, we're doing a great job of this. Not a perfect job, uh, but uh, certainly less people smoke now than probably uh, in a long time um, in the past. Drink in moderation. Um, drinking isn't always bad. Uh, in fact, having a, a, a drink might be good for your blood um, and keeping your cardiovascular system uh, in check. Uh, it's... Uh, alcohol thins out your blood and makes it a little bit easier uh, for your cardiovascular system. But this is in moderation, which usually means if you're a lady, maybe you're drinking one uh, cup of wine or one glass of beer or one um, shot of a drink a day maximum. And if you are a gentleman, maybe you're having two of those um, a day. Uh, but, uh, again, drinking isn't bad, but in moderation, uh, anything above that can turn more negative. Um, regulate stress. Stress is one of those silent killers where if you're having a lot of, especially negative straight, uh, stress, uh, a lot of social stress, that can actually affect you in a lot of negative ways. You're going to gain weight. You, you might lose sleep. Um, your cardiovascular system will get her, etc. And have supportive relationships. Again, if I go back to stress, if you have stress and you can turn that negative stress into positive stress by I'm upset, but now I hang out with friends and I become excited, um, that can change the, the negative um, parts of stress. Uh, the ne negative consequences of stress into positives because now you're relaxed and the stress can actually be good for you. Some leading causes of death. Um, if you remember in the past 
uh, chapters, the leading causes of death for you know young people and even early, uh, young adults tended to be homicides and suicide. But you'll notice that between 45 to 54, um, the uh, cancer has become number one. It's moved up three spots on the list. Heart disease also has moved up three spots on the list to come to number two. And accidents has come down two, and suicides has come down two to become the third and the fourth more like most likely reason for death between 45 and 54. If I go to the next level, 55 to 64, um, cancer is still up, heart disease is still up, um, but uh, respiratory disease has come up on the list four spots, and diabetes has shot up to number five, liver disease has gone down one on the list. And suicide has dropped, um, I'm sorry, all the way to number eight. I know it says four there, but that was just a mistake. Uh, all the way down to number eight. Okay. Talk a little bit about cancer. Um, so cancer is a, a chronic, non-communicable disease, which means you don't pass it from one person to the other. And specifically what cancer is, is a cluster of cells that begin to replicate. And usually cells, once they replicate to a certain uh, amount of times, then the cells will just die. They cannot replicate any further. But uh, cancer cells don't do this. They continue to replicate, and they basically create a tumor. Now, so some tumors can be benign, and if it's benign, it basically means that the even though this tumor is growing and might have to be removed, um, it doesn't it, uh, it it won't spread, and it's unlikely to present uh, any threat to to your life. <laughs> And some tumors are malignant, which means that the tumor, number one, will grow and sometimes it will invade other surrounding tissue. And sometimes if it gets into your bloodstream, it can invade a completely different part of your body. And when it does this, uh, we call that, uh, that we say that the tumor has metastasized. That is that it has moved from one part of the body to the other, and now it is affecting some other part of the body. And of course, now it becomes harder to stop it because it's in two parts or three parts of the body. Now, um, cancer begins when uh, something changes in the DNA of the cell, and now there's no stopping the cell from. Uh, excuse me, from replicating. And it continues to replicate over and over and over again. Now, there's a lot of reasons why this could happen. Uh, we know that some cancers are uh, hereditary. Uh, breast cancer is like that. Um, it could be problems with the immune system, some hormonal factors. But we also know that cancer uh, can be affected by carcinogens. And so certain uh, viruses, chemical compounds, um, for example, when you smoke or if you are in the sun for long periods of time, the ultraviolet uh, radiation can create uh, cancers, that is, can create some part of your body, of your cells, to start replicating uncontrollably. Um, the death incidence triples uh, between the ages of 55 to 64 as compared to 45 to 54. So between the early part of your middle uh, adulthood and the later decade of your middle adulthood, uh, excuse me, um, cancer triples um, in uh in, in severity, most uh, more people get it during the ages of 55 to 64. Also, African Americans are more likely to have um, colorectal 
and prostate cancers as opposed to white Americans. Um, this is quite likely uh, uh, due to, you know, socioeconomic reasons. Um, worse foods, right? So if you're poor, African-American, Latino, um, people are more likely to be poor um, statistically and uh, just sort of per capita um, than uh, their white counterparts. And so they're much more likely to deal with, you know, bad foods, high sugar intake, high fat intake uh, affecting uh, their, uh, excuse me, affecting their their cancer rates. And then on top of that, um, if they wait uh, to get treatment or to go to the doctor for early detection, then that makes it way more likely that they may die because of those issues. Um, cigarette smoking, also, as I mentioned, diet, also uh, contribute to cancer. Um, you see here some uh, factors, obviously biological, psychological, and sociocultural factors, um, some of which I've already hit on. Uh, very quickly, heart disease as well is something that uh, one of those uh, issues that comes up um, in middle adulthood that before even in early adulthood just wasn't really an issue that most people dealt with all of a sudden becomes super important. Um, so heart disease uh, is caused by insufficient flow of blood to the heart specifically. And one of the main reasons why this happens is arterio, uh, arteriosclerosis, which basically just means that the, um, the arteries have begun to harden. Why does this uh, happen? Mostly because of fatty deposits inside of the arteries. And when we talk about stress, this is one of the things that stress does. Um, uh, when you have high amounts of stress, um, and especially when it's prolonged stress, when it's done just like for 10 minutes and then it goes away, it's for hours or days you have the stress. Well, that can damage your arteries and then the gunk that is in your bloodstream, which includes, you know, things like cholesterol um, and other fats, other gunk that is in there starts to build up. The plaque starts to build up and uh, it can get worse and worse until basically the artery starts to harden and now you it, it's harder to control, right? So your um, autonomic nervous system naturally controls whether your artery gets, you know, more dilated or more constricted. Now we can't do this well. And so blood flow has a, a harder time getting to where it's supposed to get to. Some signs of a heart attack, intense and prolonged chest pain. This isn't usually that sharp chest pain that everybody gets every once in a while, where sometimes if, if you just hold it, it kind of seems to go away and it kind of comes and goes naturally. That's not like that. Um, most people who have heart attacks with chest pain say that it's like a squeezing or a crushing feeling um, uh, in the heart and chest area, not necessarily a sharp pain. And uh, sometimes the pain goes to different parts of the body. So you might feel it you know, in your chest area, lower chest area, abdomen area. Sometimes it'll shoot out to your left shoulder or arm. Um, and so uh, the pain is not only crushing, but it sort of uh, uh, moves on uh, to other parts of the body. Now, some people don't have chest pain, but they will have the abdomen pain and the shoulder pain. And sometimes they'll think that they are having, um, excuse me, you know, heartburn. And for example, if you're having heartburn, you take heartburn medicine, and it's not really doing anything. And especially if you know that heart disease runs in your family, that might be a good time to get checked. Um, 
shortness of breath, uh, fainting or weakness, a uh, heavy perspiration that is you start to sweat, um, and anxiety and fear. Usually these just kind of all come at once. You start to sweat, can't really breathe, you kind of feel weak and fainted, um, and there's a weird feeling of apprehension and fear that come along with it. Uh, as I mentioned, there are biological reasons for heart disease. It can run in the families. Um, there are psychological uh, reasons. I already mentioned, it says they're, they're type A behaviors. Type A personalities are people who are just naturally become hostile quickly. They hold on to their feelings of anger. They can't let them go. And so they become agitated. Um, they're, you know, they're usually very angry or upset while work. Um, uh, at work. These are uh, type A personalities. In other words, they hold on to negative stress. And negative stress, as I mentioned, can relate to um, heart disease. The, uh, obviously, other types of stress, job stress, chronic fatigue, anxiety, depression, uh, patterns of consumption. So if you drink a whole lot, um, that can have a negative effect on your cardiovascular uh, by, uh, excuse me, uh, system, uh, smoking, overeating, especially fatty foods, high sugar amounts of food, um, uh, sudden stressors, and physical inactivity. So if you're not working out on a regular basis, sometimes people, doctors will tell people, you know, um, you're going to have to at least stand up on a regular basis or at least walk for five minutes every day. Once your doctor starts telling you that, that's that's too little movement. Um, if, if a five-minute walk is a vigorous activity to you, that is too little movement. You're going to have to start doing that five-minute walk and little by little uh, work up. That is too little. And then, as I mentioned, some sociocultural factors, which include ethnic uh, differences. Um, most of these have nothing to do with the biology of ethnic differences and has more to do with the sociocultural factors associated with ethnic differences. Let's talk a little bit about the immune system. Okay. Um, so obviously your immune system is your body's defense uh, to disease. Um, we're talking about white blood cells here. Um, and your white blood cells, uh, uh, sometimes we call those uh, leukocytes, right? Um, and they are the ones that create antibodies like cytokines that attack the uh, whatever is foreign in your body. And usually your white blood cells will figure out that something is not supposed to be there by the shape of that something, by the shape of that germ, or by the shape of that virus, or whatever thing is in your body that shouldn't be there. And uh, these white blood cells usually will stick to whatever it is they're trying to kill, and uh, they will develop cytokine or other antibodies to try to attack that foreign object. Once they figure out how to attack it, then they, uh, the white blood cell basically remembers and it will create these uh, antibodies to attack other uh, germs that are similar to it. That is why often if you get sick by one uh, infection, um, then if you get infected by that same thing later on, it won't uh, it won't make you as sick or sick at all, because your white blood cells already know how to fight that. Think chickenpox. You get chickenpox when you're young. When you're older, even if you get chickenpox, your body already knows how to fight that, and so you don't have the symptoms anymore. Okay. Um, stress. Uh, a short amount of stress can boost the immune system, but prolonged stress, social stress that lasts, again, hours or days, that can have negative effects on your immune system. Um, okay. 
Let's talk a little bit about sexuality in uh, middle adulthood. Um, uh, people in middle adulthood still have sex between ages 40s into uh, their 60s. That still happens. But there is a decline in frequency. Often women uh, between ages of 50 to 59, but some women much younger than that, will start to um, not be as sexually aroused by you know, their partners or in general. And so um, they would still like to be sexually aroused. They still love their husband or their partner. They, um, they still find them attractive. They still want to be in a relationship with them. They're just not sexually, um, excuse me, uh, being sexually aroused anymore. And this is likely due to factors that include both mental and physiological uh, uh, issues. Um, Again, lack of sexual desire is usually the most common problem amongst women, where for men, the most uh, most common problem uh, in middle adulthood is erectile dysfunction. That is, a man cannot uh, get an erection anymore. There are drugs that help men get an erection, and those drugs do fix a portion of a sexual desire for women, the physical part. So there are uh, drugs like female Viagra, which make, you know, bring more blood to the genitals. But women's sexuality or female sexuality is not always the same as male sexuality. And so where getting giving a man an erection fixes sexual desire issues for men, it doesn't do the same thing for women. And so you can make a woman physiologically, um, uh, excuse me, uh, sexually functional, but mentally that does nothing for her. And so she will still feel like she doesn't want to have sex. She will still lack sexual desire, even though physiologically, uh, uh, she, there is a blood flow to the genitals. Uh, women also have to go through a few different systems in middle uh, adulthood. Uh, they will probably begin menopause uh, between the ages of 46 to 50 on average. Um, and menopause is when a woman stops menstruating. She stops having a period. This doesn't happen all at once. And in fact, a lot of women begin uh, perimenopause um, before they even uh, go through the actual menopause. And so uh, three to 11 months um, of irregular periods are occurring before there is a full pause or stop of the periods. And so basically, uh, you know, uh, their uh, period becomes uh, not regular for a while. Sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't have it for months. Sometimes they have it a few times, um, you know, month after month. But then eventually menopause finally hits and then it stops altogether. Um, Obviously, there's this gradual decline in reproductive uh, capacity um, that lasts for about 15 years. Um, This is during, you know, again, uh, uh, around 45 to 60, women can still have babies, um, but it's irregular. Um, And uh, eventually, after menopause, then she would not be able to have that. There is also an estrogen deficiency that occurs um, after menopause, especially, uh, or during the perimenopause when the woman is going, you know, uh, about to uh, lose her reproductive abilities. And without the estrogen, now women will get night sweats and hot flashes. Basically, their blood rushes differently. Sometimes the blood rushes really close to the... um, excuse me, to the skin, to the outer portions of the skin. And that makes women uh, feel more hot, sort of hot all at once. Um, and they might get cold sweats. Um, and again, 
this is just one of the symptoms to going through menopause. Now, um, other uh, excuse me, estrogen deficiency signs, dizziness, headaches, joint pains, tingling in the hands of feet, burning or itchy skin or heart palpitations. Um, uh, not enough estrogen can lead to osteoporosis. This is one of the things that um, estrogen does in men as well, right? Men have just a little bit of estrogen, about 5% the amount that women have. And men use it for bone issues. And so do women. It's just that women use it for other issues as well. It's just now when women go through menopause and the estrogen levels go down significantly, one of the things that happens is that they start having bone issues. And um, now the bones might become more brittle. And so women more often than men have to take you know, calcium supplements um, and other things to make sure that their bones stay strong. Um, uh, estrogen uh, deficiency is going to also lead to impaired cognitive function. Now, um, there are hormone replacement therapies where they'll give you estrogen so that you don't go through all the symptoms of menopause. Some of the symptoms like, you know, um, uh, hot flashes can be really overwhelming. Cognitive can be uh, deficiencies can be very overwhelming. But oftentimes, women don't want to like grow hair like men do. They don't want to grow a beard, for example. And lack of estrogen can sometimes get that to happen. And so, women, uh, a lot of women, especially uh, now modern women who are still living a good, healthy life, they don't want to go through that. And uh, they will take hormone uh, supplements. This is fine. There are a lot of way, reasons why this is good, but it does increase breast cancer. It does increase strokes, and it can increase blood clots. Um, and so there are other things that can be taken instead of estrogen, uh, like uh, uh, progestin, um, and uh, selective uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are called SSRIs, uh, to l lessen some of the hot flashes and uh, some of the more negative cognitive or emotional issues that come with menopause. Um, obviously, women go to menopause. Uh, men's uh, decline also in uh, their abil ability to produce sex hormones, and that obviously affects their fertility as well. All right, so here I'm going to talk about cognitive development in middle adulthood. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there is a multi-directionality um, and uh, inter-individual uh, variability uh, within the development of people in middle adulthood. That is, everybody uh, sort of grows differently and it depends on who you are, what you're learning, etc. Unlike uh, early in your childhood and even your adolescence where development kind of went one way, um, uh, development and in intellectual abilities in middle adulthood kind of go all over the place. Some things get better, some things get worse. Um, that is what multi-directionality uh, means. It means as some things get better, as, as some intelligences get better, some intelligences get worse. Um, uh, Inter-individual variability uh, specifically uh, is when uh, people mature differently because of your cultural settings or your social settings or where you work or whatever, right? So if you work at a specific place, you're going to learn more about that than someone like me who doesn't work there, for example. And plasticity is uh, one of the things that uh, will go down. Um, uh, for the most part, as you get older, your plasticity goes down. There's less chance for your brain to change dramatically. And if you were to damage a specific part of your brain in middle adulthood, the chances that another part of your brain will take over the functions of the part that's damaged go down significantly. Um, now, uh, okay. Now what you're seeing here are some of the changes 
Now, one of the things you'll notice is that numeric ability goes down, um, spatial ability or spatial orientation, uh, verbal and um, uh, inductive reasoning um, continue to stay high or normal, um, but your uh, verbal, excuse me, your uh, numeric ability goes down. Um, okay. One of the reasons for this is that your fluid intelligence shifts down. Um, as you get older, you become less able to take in new information and work through it um, and uh, come up with a, an answer based on brand new information. So maybe you're good at using a specific program, but if I give you a new program to work on, it's harder for that 40 some to 60 some um, adult to work through and to figure out and to learn. And sometimes it's not even that different. It's just slightly different. But the older you are, the harder it is to deal with new information like that. Um, and so because of this, number intelligence can go down, right? Because uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, it's harder to analyze a bunch of information. Uh, now, if, if you if your job is doing math, right? If you're an accountant or a math teacher or maybe a statistician or something, well, then you'll probably see that that, that decline isn't as obvious as the rest of us. Now, uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Memory is also going to go down as you uh, get older. Um, it's harder to screen out distractions. And because of that, it's harder to focus and it's harder to rehearse the things that you want to remember. Um, things always kind of get in your way and it's hard for you to focus. Um, uh, rapid classification and categorization also um, start to go down because um, uh, rehearsal uh, it becomes more difficult. Memorizing lists of words, numbers, or passages, rote rehearsal, all of these things become more difficult. Um, now, uh, middle-aged people, their verbal abilities tend to not change. They tend to be about the same as they were when they were younger. Um, uh, because of whatever, let's say whatever you work at, you have been working there for a long time, your crystallized intelligence continues to develop. And so your problem solving skills in that way don't necessarily get damaged because um, that's part of your crystallized intelligence. Um, uh, social skills um, uh, might, uh, have a difficulty if they are something kind of brand new. Um, now, that's going to be harder in your 60s, late 60s and 70s, so in late adulthood. In middle adulthood, there's still a good chance that this person can out, kind of work through it. Your middle-aged mom and dad can probably meet your, you know, a, a transgender friend and figure out how to be social and how to not be offensive uh, to this individual. But by the time that they're in their late 60s and 70s, that's gonna be harder because just like that program that they have a hard time relearning because it's a new version, um, the same thing is true with these social skills. But in middle adulthood, they still should have a pretty decent ability of dealing with new social or uh, acquired skills. Um, emotional stability tends to not be too lost. Uh, creativity um, also does not go down in middle adulthood. And in some ways, it might actually get better. So whereas young adults tend to be most creative in music and mathematics and physics, right? That's sort of the height um, of kind of creativity is in um, young adulthood. Um, 
writers and visual artists tend to do some of their better work in middle adulthood. Now, um, emotionally charged and fervent kind of works are also better produced in uh, young adulthood. Uh, the middle adulthood artist tends to uh, take their work to the next level better, uh, but they're not necessarily as emotionally charged as they were when they were in young adulthood. When people come back to school in middle adulthood, they also tend to be highly motivated. They're much more likely to do a lot of the work, to get started early, to try to learn as much as possible. Um, because for the uh, mature learner, usually they're number one, afraid that they've been out of um, the student game for too long, so they kind of put all their heart into it. Also, the adult learner kind of knows how important education is, uh, whereas the young learner, the kid who is straight out of high school coming into college, school, college is a lot like high school, and they're still kind of uh, following a lot of those patterns where, you know, no middle uh, aged person is thinking, oh, college, that's going to be a lot like high school. Uh, they're coming into it for a specific goal. Um, uh, women are much more likely to return to school in middle adulthood, and African American women uh, often come back to school in middle adulthood. And um, usually, at least in, in, in American culture today, um, African American women are one of the most uh, well educated populations or part of the population because they come back to school um, uh, in middle adulthood uh, and then they stay longer. Uh, they tend to get their master's or PhDs levels. Um, and so we see a lot of cultural changes um, uh, come. All right, guys, uh, this is chapter 15. And uh, in the next video, I'm going to do chapter 16, which will be our last video. Have a good one.